Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so we are happy to have Santosh Vampala here. He um, came up here for all of five hours, so, but there are five intense hours, right? <laughs> okay, and maybe next time he'll visit for longer. That would be nice. Thank you. Uh, and um, I think that Adam is going to try to do something for him oh, after like some kind of dinner or something. Really quick dinner after. <laughs> Okay, so, so anyway, Santosh is here from Georgia Tech, and he's going to be talking about? Higher order principal components. Higher order principal components. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's always a bit of a risky thing to come give a talk when Adam's in the audience or involved in <laughs> giving the talk, but uh, I did my best to prepare, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, great. So um, the, the, the title of the talk is Higher Order Principal Components. I won't write that. But uh, to jump into the motivation, let me uh, remind you, introduce you to a well-known problem and one special case of this that will more or less provide the motivation for the talk. Okay. So the problem is finding a clique in a graph explicitly given graph, finding a clique. I think this audience is all theory or theoretically inclined, so I don't need to define these terms. Please raise your hand if you want me to define anything. You should just explain what it has to do with social networks and social networks. Well, a clique is a... <laughs> 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 clique, by definition, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> of extreme relevance. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, it's, it's NP-hard, hard, hard to approximate as the work of uh, Madhu and later people have showed to within really n to the 1 minus little o 1. So where n is the size of the graph. Um, what about if the graph is random? So I'm trying to put more detail as we get closer to the topic of the talk. If the graph is random, they just say g n 1 half. Every pair is an edge with probability 1 half or non-edge. Then um, so g n 1 half has a clique of size 2 log n with high probability. And uh, uh, we, we can find one of size log n easily, uh, just a greedy algorithm, take the largest degree vertex and largest degree neighbor, and so on. And uh, the following question, I think first posed by Karp, is give a polynomial algorithm. Does there exist a polynomial time algorithm to find a clique of size? Uh, 1 plus epsilon log n is open for any epsilon greater than 0. Let's, so this is easy to do in n to the log n time, which makes it interesting and unlikely that there is any standard hardness result. But nevertheless, no. Yes. Two times that exists. But it can't find But we can't find even 1.01. Yes. And in Yes. Yes, in n to the log n, you can find the largest because you find a subset. All you want is a large subset of this clique, and then you look for everybody who has high degree in there, and only the clique neighbors will have high degree in there. So once you find a large subset of this, not even you know, n to the omega log n, you're, you're done. So even easier. So let's make this even easier. So this was asked maybe 30 years ago now. It's not, not, not much progress. Let's go, what if I take a random graph? I'm still with gn 1 half. But now we plant a clique of si with k vertices in it, where k is going to be much larger than 2 log n. Okay? So g n 1 half plus k clique. Right? And k is uh, much larger than log n, or 2 log n. What can you do in this case? Okay? Um, so we can do better than the worst case of, you know, so, how, so the smaller the clique you can plant and find it, the better. Right? So the following algorithm, 
will allow us to find cliques of size constant times square root n. Okay, so it w so k greater than c square root n, and you can make the c uh, small as you want. But let let's say c is ten for what I'm going to show. Following algorithm, I'm going to construct an adjacency matrix. So you're given the graph. It's coming from this model, but you're given the graph, and in this adjacency matrix, we'll have uh, ones for edges and minus ones for non-edges. Okay, so a i j is 1 if ij is an edge and minus 1 otherwise. And let's say the diagonal is 0. That doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Now, in this, so maybe if it's not an edge, find the top eigenvector of this matrix. Okay, so find top eigenvector. Now, uh, in this uh, vector, find the largest k components in magnitude. k largest components. And then, find all the vertices whose degree in this subset is at least 3k over 4. So output set of vertices whose degree in this set, this meaning this, this set, is at least a 3k over 4. That's it. That's the algorithm. Largest yeah. In Largest in magnitude, yes. Absolutely right. That's right. OK. Um, this will work for k bigger than constant times root n. Now let me just, uh, for this particular 3 fourths, this is going to work for something like 10. And uh, let me just. Show you. So this, this is this is from uh, this was sh shown by Alon Krivilovich and Sudokov in '98, and uh, this is the state of the art. We don't know how to do better than this in polynomial time. Now, why am I mentioning this? Well, let's look at what they did. They said, take this adjacency matrix A, and let me break it up into its expectation and 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 and, and the rest. Now the expectation of A. Well, there's a clique there where everything is 1. Wherever you planted it, I might as well take it to be the leftmost block. And then it's 0 everywhere else. And then it's the rest of it here, well, it's 0 in this part and random. It's just 1 minus 1 with probability half. OK. Now, if you look at the top eigenvector of just this part, that will exactly be the indicator vector of this, scaled to be unit vector. And so the eigenvalue of this part of the expectation is just k. Now it's 1 over root k is on those, and it's k squared block, so it's just k. What about the eigenvalue of this random n by n matrix? So that's the classic Fourier de Komlosh theorem, holds more generally, where you only need a independence and a bound on the variance. And then uh, they get here that lambda 1 of this, this, let me call this matrix B, is two, about 2 square root n. So if k was higher than root n, you'd expect the eigenvector of A to be much closer to this. And then exa that's exactly what you can prove from the bound on, the, on, on this 2 now. And then once you get lots of vertices from here in the eigenvector, you, you just pick up everything else. So, so that's it, right? <coughs> OK, so this, was, um, this is the state of the art for, for what we can do with this. So now wh what could we possibly do to, uh, to, to improve on this? So in uh, about five years ago, uh, Fries and Cannon proposed the following <coughs> following um, uh, approach. They said, let me consider, let's consider a polynomial. Uh, it's just going to be the summation of a, i, j, k, x, i, x, j, x, k. It's summed over all i, j, k. I have to tell you what these things are. It's a polynomial in the axis. A is a, a coefficient, degree 3, homogeneous. And uh, let's maximize this over unit vectors x. Okay. Now this is very natural and related to what's being done there. So right. So the eigenvector would just be over matrices a i j here and x i x j. So that would be the x transpose a x since a is a symmetric matrix. So they just generalized it to a degree three polynomial. And uh, what should what do they take a to be? And that that's the key idea. And they said let's take a i j k to be the parity of the number of edges in the triangle induced by ijk. Okay, so if it has 
one or three edges, it's one, and if it's zero or two edges, it's minus one. So this is just the you know if, if I think of y as the indicator variable, whether an edge is present or not, or let's say the one minus one variable, then this is y i j times y j k times y k i. Okay, and y tells you whether this edge is one or minus. So this will be one or minus one. It's a tensor. Now let's look at this big tensor. You know, three-dimensional array. And uh, uh, you know, we we you can write it as this a as as a, its expectation plus what's left. And it's ex the expectation part. If you look at the clique in this graph, there's a clique here. Everything is connected, so every triangle has the same parity one. There's a block corresponding to that clique, where it's one, and then the rest is zero, because uh, every time you a triangle leaves this, the parity could go to one or minus one with probability one half. Okay, so it's going to be this plus some expectation tensor. I'll just call <coughs> it B. Now this is not an independent. It's not an IID tensor like you have in the matrix case. Uh, however, you know each entry by itself looks random, and there is lots of randomness here. So what they managed to show uh, is the following that well this part of it so going by the same reasoning if you look at here look at this this block tensor and ask what's the uh, um, the vector x that's going to maximize this polynomial which you can call the spectral norm of this tensor uh, it's going to be again just put take the uniform vector on this block and zeros everywhere else and the value you get you know it's 1 over root k but 3 times so it's k cubed divided by k to the 3 halves so you get k to the 3 halves as the top eigenvalue here now the crucial point is what's the two norm of the random tensor? It's not entirely random. If it had been entirely random, we again get back square root n. Okay, and that's again a simple classical fact. But here it's not completely random. It has these dependencies. Nevertheless, they managed to show that the two norm of this tensor, so, is uh, by two norm I just mean the maximum value you can achieve for this degree three polynomial is uh, uh, o tilde square root n. So they got log to the some small power. And so in order for this algorithm to work, so what's the algorithm now proposed to finding the planted clique? Maximize this quantity, find the vector x that, uh, uh, that, that more or less aligns with this clique. And then once you find a large enough block, you boost that up, bootstrap to find the whole clique. Very similar to that. And so for that, you would need that k to the 3 halves beats root n times polylog factors. And so their theorem was, if you could maximize this, then k greater than n to the one third times polylog n suffices. Okay, and they left the paper with two questions. One is, uh, what's the complexity of computing this? Now, this is not the you know w not the worst case possible tensor. You could ask this question for any such polynomial, uh, or you could ask this for this semi-random thing here. They asked for the semi-random thing, and then the second thing is. What if you go to higher order tensors? Can we improve on this? So just to complete the motivation, in a paper with uh, Charlie Brubaker um, in 2009, um, so they, they give a very combinatorial proof that uh, not that different from Freire Komlosch's proof, where they have to consider walks of various lengths to argue this norm is small. <coughs> it seemed uh, very hard to generalize, or at least it wasn't clear how to generalize it. We did manage to prove uh, the following, that in fact, if you consider not this degree 3 polynomial, but a degree r polynomial, where, or degree k, okay. sorry, yes, r, let's, let's stick with r, thank you, uh, uh, um, a i1 through i r, x i1, x i r, and you maximize that over unit vectors, <coughs> then, uh, and, and proceed this way, uh, the, the, the Two theorems. One is independent of any, any of this problem. Just the two norm of. So I have to tell you what the a is. That's really the only thing, and that's just going to be the parity of the number of edges in the subgraph induced by that set subset of indices. That's it. So it's direct generalization of edge or triangle. That the two norm of the random part is, uh, in fact, uh, uh, still a function of r uh, times uh, o tilde n square root n. So it grows my only with R, not not with not with N. Uh, by by a log factor, but not not. Uh, this O tilde, O tilde. Yeah, so, so it's the same. It recovers. 
And not only that, if you could maximize this form, then k greater than n to the 1 over r times polynomial in r and log n suffices. So basically, you can recover cliques of size poly log n by choosing r to be something like log n, if this approach. So that's the motivation for considering this thing. Uh, and, uh, but um, on the other hand, if we just look at some negative, uh, what can we say about the complexity? So, so, so one question of this talk is, what's the complexity of this polynomial optimization of, of computing this spectral two norm by which we just, I just mean exactly this, you know, A could be a third order or anything greater than three, greater than or equal to three. Yeah. Of estimating. Yeah. Question is also interested even the click it's easy to do in quasi polynomial time. This question right. interesting also in quasi polynomial time. Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. Yes. So uh, uh, right. We would like to find clicks. Uh, uh, right. If you if you could if you could uh, yeah. This is more general question of the clicks quasi polynomial. Right, because now I've moved away from <coughs> from this right. Right. So, um, so do you need to do exactly? I mean, you don't need to exactly compute this. That's right. So, in fact, so in fact I mean, for large R, you can, in fact, be very crude. Exponential in R. These, right? You could be exponential in R off in the, in, you could approximate because this you're to. you're still going to have large correlation. Exactly. You'd still have large correlation. So, you could, you could uh, that's why I'm saying estimating here. We don't understand. So, here's, here's what we know how to do. You can approximate this quantity to within a factor of n to the R over 2. Okay, so uh, minus 1. R, so f I have to choose this so that uh, for 3, you get root n. So yeah, this, this, this we know how to do. It's hard to approximate. So this is upper bound. And it's hard to approximate to a factor better than a uh, constant. Um, I forget what the constant is to the power of r. Worst case, NP hard, yeah. Uh, for three, it's you, you get a root. You pick up a root n. For three, it's one half square root n. R equals three, and then you pick up one half for every r. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. So it's hard. So this is a big gap here. So just as an approximation problem, there's this gap between. The upper bound and lower bound, and I don't know what the complexity is. Um, um, this this is just worst case right now. <coughs> For the random case, I don't know any hardness uh, or algorithm. Yeah. So what should be uh, what should we be comparing the upper bound against into the R? That's uh, what should into the R over two. What what? Uh, there's a, no. This is a factor. This is the approximation factor. So it's hard to right, approximate. No, what's, like, what's the trivial approximation of this? Mm. Yeah, I mean, n to the r, the total number of entries total is n to the r. Entries. Yeah, so if you just found the largest entry and picked a 0, 1 vector that put all its weight there. So n to the r is. is yeah, OK. So this, this, this is the setting here. Now, uh, I guess, I mean, there seem to be, this problem seems to have connections with lots of other things. One that we're exploring right now is if you can do this, it might help in the problem of learning sparse parities. Uh, I don't want to go into that. But, uh, but if, if, if you were, um, you know, if you look at this result, I guess if you were more inclined to believe it's hard, you could just conjecture that, that this is hard to within, uh, even the clique problem is hard even, even when k is, is polylog n. Um, and if you wanted to give it a name, I suppose you could call it the unique clique conjecture. <laughs> uh, or maybe to distinguish it a little bit further, maybe unique clique identification conjecture, also known as UCIC. <laughs> but <laughs> you see? <laughs> this was not planted. I'm sorry. He's just a very corny guy. <laughs> OK. 
Um, okay, so that, that's, I, I hope that's sufficient motivation. No, no, the <laughs> no. Okay, so how is it that we're able to do this for the case r equals two, right? I mean, this is not a convex function or something nice that you just can do with a standard, uh, you know, convex program or or, or 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 powerful tool like that. So in the matrix case, really, the way you do this is this is this power iteration, right? I mean, it's uh, you want to find an x that maximizes x transpose a x. Well, let, let let me to simplify notation. I'll write this polynomial as a of x x x, okay. and sometimes we'll use different vectors here. So, but what do we do in the matrix case? We start with some y, and then you compute the vector a y. By that I mean you apply it once, right? So you take the summation uh, a i j y j gives you a vector. You scale this to be a unit vector, and repeat. So you set y to be a y divided by the length of a y. And repeat this iteration. It's going to stop. The only possible fixed points are the uh, eigenvectors. So the representation of a is already into the r size, or are you only considering a's which are trained as parities of your r's? In the general problem, it's into the r size. This is the approximation factor. Okay. Oh, yeah. This is hardness for the approximation factor. I mean, yeah. We are happy with running times which are n to the i. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't know better than n to the n, basically, to do this. So. In exactly. Yeah. Okay. So this is a this is the power iteration, and that works great in the in the in the in the, in the matrix case. And so you might ask, and so when you stop, you reach a vector, you know, where a times y equals some lambda y, and that's great. That's your those are your exactly your eigenvectors. What happens if you apply something similar to the to the higher order case? Well, you have a y y, and there is a natural choice, right? You could you could apply this twice and try to set this to be the unit vector. I'll, I'll use this to may say unit vector in this direction, and and repeat this iteration, and it will actually reach a fixed point, and you'll satisfy an equation. You'll say, you know, a y y dot equals some lambda times y. So there are these well-defined uh, um, fixed points. And you could even ask for a second order local maximum. And uh, so th this, is, this is just a, a um, I mean, if you just remember some calculus. If you look at the function a y y, then the gradient of this function is just a constant times a y y dot. So this is just saying the gradient points in the direction of the current point, which is exactly the definition for a local optimum on the sphere. And uh, second order condition I could ask for is if I look at the matrix A Y, and uh, um, I'm looking for the largest eigenvector, the largest eigenvector of A Y, we want that to be Y. So you could put, uh, yes, this is as low as I'll go. <laughs> I won't go any lower. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm just just putting down two local optima conditions which in the matrix case already give you everything you want. This is just saying that um, the gradient points in the direction of the current point, so you can't improve using the gradient. It's a local optimum, literally. And this is telling you that um, the largest eigenvalue of this matrix, so really a Hessian condition, it also, also is y itself. So you couldn't use that to improve either. But unfortunately, even after imposing these conditions, the number of solutions you could have to both these together, or either one of them, These are so you could arrive at fixed points that sat satisfy both these conditions, which would be sufficient in the matrix case to get your eigenvectors. Here, in this case, um, you can have exponentially many in the dimension. Okay, so this is a you know, classical fact. So if you had, for example, um, degree two equations, which would correspond to the r equal to three case, you know you could think of them as intersections of uh, second order polynomials. So let's say ellipsoids even. Then in, in two dimensions, you could have four solutions. And in n dimensions, you could have two to the n solutions. This is Bezout's theorem from basic algebra. Or if you have uh, degree d polynomials, you could have up to d to the n solutions, even when, when, when you have n equations. So the number of these solutions can be exponentially many, unlike eigenvectors. And as a result, they're not even orthogonal. These local optima don't have to be orthogonal. 
no, no structure here. And um, so it see, seems quite hopeless. OK. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is this is an algorithms talk, is show that, in fact, the local optima, just the local optima, can be very useful and will help us uh, in uh, giving efficient algorithms for, for, uh, uh, for, for some problems. OK? So that, that's uh, for the general case, for, for, for R. R will be a small constant, but still, yeah, for R. So that's, that's the plan. OK, so let me jump to what the problem is. Yes? So if A was a matrix, then using such a transition, a solution, you can eventually find the rank for A, right? The rank of A, yes. Can you use this? To find the no. No, subtracting no. No. So the 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 there is no such unique decomposition for uh, for even degree three things. So what you're asking is, can you find the minimum possible decomposition into say rank one tensors? Uh, this greedy method of just finding a local optimum and repeating uh, doesn't give you the minimum. So if even if you find the global maximum, it's actually false. Yeah. So there are examples where you know, if you find the highest each time, you end up with a much larger rank than the true rank. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, trying to generalize anything beyond uh, the, just the spectral norm, this quantity, also seems tricky. So for example, the best rank k approximation of a matrix is well defined. For a tensor, uh, it's not even well defined. So the limit becomes rank k plus 1 and so on. Yeah. Okay. So what are the problems I want to address with, with this? Um, so the, the, the starting point, yes. This one? Well, this, this was a generalized the experiment. Right. Yes. So um, the question about number of iterations is, it, 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 no, it's not entirely clear. What you can show is that. Um, if you replace having the same vector with three vectors x, y, z, then it does converge. Uh, the number of iterations still depends on the tensor. Now what you can do instead, and we will do that, is you can use approximate local optima, where um, you only make a step if your gradient is large enough. So you can, you can, you can satisfy these conditions to arbitrary accuracy, arbitrary, but, but, but to go exactly, it's not clear what the number of iterations would be. No, this is a quadratic equation, right? Already, even for r equal to three. Sorry. You can get arbitrarily close. Yes. Well, that's yeah. Uh, 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 you'll you'll get you can get as close as you want. It's not clear if you'll hit the local option. Yeah, yeah. We're just going to do gradient descent. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the, 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 the algorithmic problem I want to address is um, a generalization of um, the problem of um, learning a K junta. Or, uh, I'm sure many of you must are probably familiar with learning juntas. And this is the problem where you're uh, given uh, uh, examples that are uh, uh, 0, 1, or minus 1, 1. And uh, uh, these examples have, uh, have labels. Um, also, uh, say one and minus one. one. The label is also one or minus one, and uh, uh, you would like to learn the labeling function. And the assumption is that the label depends only on uh, some subset of coordinates. Okay, so maybe uh, 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 it's a function of just uh, uh, the first r coordinates, and the rest you can ignore some subset of R coordinates. So that's the general problem of learning a <laughs> K junta. So one classic example of this is learning a parity, where it's, it's an unknown parity, but you're told that it's a parity of just R variables. And how, how do you learn, learn this? Um, uh, but, but it could be any function of these R variables. Now, the, naively, you can solve this problem in time roughly n to the R by just guessing the R variables, going down to that subset, and then running some algorithm whose complexity depends only on R. Okay. 
the generalization I want to consider here is what you could call, call learning uh, k subspace junta. By that I mean that there is an unknown subspace of dimension k. So there exists v unknown is Rn and the dimension of v is k and the label for a point depends only on its projection to the subspace. So the label depends only on the projection of x to the subspace v. Projection to v of x. Now, um, so this, this clearly generalizes that because the subspace doesn't have to be a subset of coordinates. It seems much more uh, general because, for example, for k equal to 1, right, you already get half spaces. Every half space, the, 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 the function that's one half space is a one subspace junta, but it could be an n junta. Right? Um, for k equal to 2, for example, you could get degree 2 polynomials or uh, intersections of two half spaces or, or any, 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 any such things. Now, k equal to 1, we already know how to solve in polynomial time. This, this we can pack learn using linear programming. So, so yes. Yes, I'm uh, in Rn now, yes. Yeah. Um, so that's the generalization. Uh, um, so you know there's a subs uh, subspace that, 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 that that's all that matters. There's a relevant subspace. The rest of the coordinates are, in, are, are noise, noisy attributes. And uh, you, you're given labels that depend only on a function of that subspace, and you'd like to learn this. So, well, we'll consider classes classes for it. Yes, exactly. So, as in, in a new learning problem, uh, we'll we'll need to know some bound on the complexity of this hypothesis class, and we'd like to learn it. And for example, no, certainly we can't do better than the VC dimension bound. So, okay. So, b if you want to keep an example in mind, fine example is an intersection of k half spaces or a degree k polynomial. Okay. okay so, subspace junta. For short, I'll call it a K Sunta, <coughs> pronounced Sunta. Can you say it? No, no, Sunta. <laughs> oh, you got it wrong. Sunta. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> um, sorry, that's, uh, okay. Each of these interruptions comes with a cost, right? I have to get back to, <laughs> to the top. Okay. So, um, um, so what can we do about these? So what's the state of the art for learning these? Before I introduce, you know, wh where we're going with the main technique. Well, for for the intersections, so for some concept classes, when L is a convex concept, L is convex, and now in a learning problem, there's also a distribution on examples, and the distribution on examples F is Gaussian. It's any Gaussian, but it's a Gaussian. So under these assumptions, so a convex concept in this k-dimensional space, so for example, intersection of half spaces, and f is Gaussian. Under these assumptions, what we can do is um, uh, uh, learn in time that's uh, uh, a function of k. Yes, when you say convex, it's just Everything that has one la plus label, say, is, 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 uh, is, yes, is in a convex set. Yes. Convex set gives you a plus label, and everything outside gives you minus label. So in this case, we can actually do it. And the only reason I'm mentioning this, that, and th this more or less captures what's known for this problem, is that the technique is PCA. Okay, so uh, we have to we take the original distribution, make it isotropic, so make its covariance matrix, make it uh, up to second moments it looks like a Gaussian, and then you look at just the positive examples, and look at their smallest k eigenvectors that. That, that subspace is in fact going to be V or approximate V very closely. So that's a, that, that's, that's a theorem. PCA solves this. I, I, I'm writing this very roughly for motivation. We'll, we'll make it more precise when we go to, go to the new theorems. Solves this case in time um, some function of K alone times poly n. Okay, only for Gaussian and convex. 
OK, so for general convex concepts, it's in fact exponential in K. Um, for, uh, for the case when uh, it's an intersection of half spaces, it's, a, uh, it's all still exponential, but it's, it's a simple exponential. Since there's always an exponential in K, is there any reason why it should be? No. I, I no, no, no lower bound here at all. I mean this and, and then also for F Gaussian, uh, <coughs> presumably that could be generalized beyond just Gaussian. Not this algorithm. So even it's still it's still open. For example, even <coughs> if you uh, even if you um, re replace Gaussian with uniform in a ball. Wasn't there some kind of uh, well, a crypto, crypto lower bound for the Yeah, there are crypto lower bounds, and there is also there are also lower bounds based on saying if you use certain hypothesis classes to learn, say for example polynomials, then you need high degree. No, no, but crypto lower bounds. Yeah, but the assumption is uh, not a standard assumption around there. Yeah. It's not for Gaussian. No, 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 nothing for Gaussian. And so on. Yeah, but even for general, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, the reason I'm mentioning this is that the way this is done is just by computing second moments of the distribution. I mean, PCA is second moment, it's x transpose AX. Okay. Is the code here to just factor in the function there, or are you actually trying to estimate the subset? Um, the problem as stated is just to factor in the function L. The way this algorithm works, in fact, you identify the subspace V, go down there, and then use what uh, uh, a, a brute force, essentially, algorithm. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. OK, so now you ask, somebody already asked, how do we generalize, go beyond Gaussians here? And uh, so we'll try to extend this in two ways. One, we want to replace this convex with something more general. More, more, you know, in fact, we'll, we'll replace it with more or less arbitrary concepts. And we want to gen generalize Gaussian here. So instead of Gaussian, we're going to assume that the, the, this is what we'll call the independent noise or noisy attributes model, where your distribution F consists of, can be factorized into a distribution on the relevant subspace. So it's some arbitrary distribution on the relevant subspace. And then times a distribution on the orthogonal subspace. So W is just orthogonal to you. Okay. So when you pick an example x, if I write it in the coordinates v, w, now there's an xv part and an xw part. You pick xv from the distribution fv, you pick xw from the distribution fw, you get your example. And there's a label of x, but the label depends only on xv. For the moment, let's say they're arbitrary. That's all. F, E, F, W are arbitrary. OK? So that's the model. Um, yes, yes, you, so you, that's right, that's right. Yes, what you, what you get is uh, you don't know V and W yet. OK, so um, I mean, that's more general, right? Gaussian, you always think of as independent coordinates. So now, it's only in the, I'm just calling, it's not introduced noise. I'm just saying these are irrelevant. Maybe I should call it, ir, uh, the coordinates W have nothing to do with the label. So they're noisy attributes or non-signal attributes. And, yeah. Uh, no, no, it's about general Gaussians. But you can make it uh, by, by transformation. Yeah. Yes, I, same thing here. As long as there exists a transformation where you get this product. Because uh, anyway, you're going to. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, what can we do here? Now, um, you could say. So, so there's a problem of learning this function that I've already proposed. How about a weaker or, or, or a related problem? Um, problem two. So, problem one was pack learning. Or learning for specific distributions. Problem two is factorize f. You know, find v and w. Given only label, labeled, uh, uh, given only examples. You don't even have labels anymore, right? So factorize f from examples. Okay. Clearly, if you could do two, then you could do one. Exactly. Right. So, so, so let, let's let's uh, let's make this more precise. Okay. And uh, what can we hope to do? So I would like to, given that f equals f v f w, find u, a subspace of R n, such that f is equal to f u times f u orthogonal. 
okay, some, and then you could recurse on this if you want. So it's not recovery. So there exists one at least, and you're finding one may not may need not be the same one. It's a completely different one. Huh? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, why 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 should we hope to be able to do this one either? So let's let's. What does this independence assumption give us? Let's look at the covariance matrix of F. So if I look at the covariance matrix of F, you have, uh, and I write it in the V W basis. There is a part that's the covariance matrix of for the V in the V subspace, and then there's a so so for F V, and then there's a part for F W, and this is zero because they're independent. So if the spectrum here and spectrum here were distinct, then simply by finding the eigenvectors of this covariance matrix, you would, uh, you would be able to find the right basis anyway, because it would have to be a basis of this union, a basis of this. And then you could try all subsets of size dimension of k uh, to figure out which part is Fv and which part is Fw. Because every time you had a guess, you can check it. You can project to those two subspaces and check if, if the distribution you get looks like a product distribution. Okay. So if, in fact, you had distinct eigenvalues here, you, would, you, you could just take a, this and be done. Yeah? Exactly. So here, n to the k would be fantastic, right? Because uh, then you are saying that even though you have sub uh, suntas, you are able to uh, do everything in time, same time as juntas. Right, right. So, the, but as naively the search is n to the n, even for you know two juntas, two suntas. Right. So, um, okay. So this doesn't work. So now let me just write down what we're going to do in, in, in the, the algorithm over there. So we'll just look at higher moments. Okay. So we'll first. Um, Make the covariance matrix the identity. So make the, the um, uh, or, or, or before I write down the algorithm, let's see what happens if, if, if the covariance matrix is in fact the identity, which we can always set up. And then let's look at the third moment. By that I mean the expectation of x dot u cube, where u is a real vector. So you're looking at the third moment in every direction. So what this is telling us is that the second moment is 1 for all u, for all unit vectors u. And the mean is 0. And now we're saying, let's look at the third moment. Okay? Is the third moment possibly informative even when the, when the matrix is isotropic? And to see this, all I'm going to do is break this up. So you can think of this as expectation of xv times uv cube, xv times uv plus x w times u w quantity cube. And this will break up into all the leading terms, and that's fine. And uh, except I'll make one change. OK, let's, uh, uh, and then the thing in the w subspace. OK, and then we have the cross terms. But I don't even have to write the cross terms down because Every time there is a, uh, let's write one of them, say, three times expectation of xv uv times xw uw squared. This is 0 because v and w are independent, and this is 0. So the cross terms disappear except for the one that is, um, uh, yeah, so, so that's all we get. Right? So now I can pull out from this the lengths. Let's make this use unit vectors again. So I'll pull out this length with the cubic term, expectation xv dot uv, let's call it uv0, unit vector in the direction of uv, plus uw cube, expectation xw, uw0 cube. OK? So this is the same quantity in the v subspace. This is the same quantity in the w subspace. And now here's the claim that if I'm trying to look for a maximum of this function. It must lie entirely in V or entirely in W unless both of these are 0. So any local maximum of this third order function must lie completely in the subspace V or completely in the subspace W or must be 0. 
Because these are now cubes. If these had been squares, then you get the same. If these had been, all you need is for these to be, to be equal, and then you can distribute any way you want. But because they are cubes, it's much more beneficial to put all your weight in one or the other. So you do a little calculus to get there. So and that this now holds for any moment. So here's uh, here's what uh, the lemma is. That in fact, um, if you just find a local maximum of the uh, uh, third order form, either you will find um, a vector in V or a vector in W, or you will find that the moment is zero. Okay, so I, I won't even write the lemma. And if you find and, and if your moments are okay, so I do have I should write down the more general lemma, which is suppose say again. It won't be zero. Exactly. That's why I won't write down the more general one. And, and if somebody wants to guess it, they're welcome to. Suppose f has the same moments, same jth moments as a Gaussian, as a standard Gaussian, as gamma. So odd moments are all zero. Even moments are what gamma, gamma, gamma j. For j less than m, <coughs> then you can factor the mth one. So if I look at the expectation of x dot u to the m for any u, you can write this as just the component of u in v to the m times this expectation of x v u v 0 to the m minus gamma m plus, that's the mom mth moment of the Gaussian, u w, same expression for w. <coughs> Expectation of x w dot u w zero to the m minus gamma. Okay. So we're saying that if the first j moment, first m minus one moments are all Gaussian, then the mth moment must factor, must must decompose, and then and, and then at this point you can conclude about the mth, the, any local maximum of the mth moment, that it must either lie in v or lie in w or itself be Gaussian. So now I can state the main algorithm. For uh, for factorizing. Um, so the first step is we're going to try to uh, find the basis, right? find the basis that that captures v and w, so that we can then search for uh, for uh, k-dimensional subsets of the basis. So you're still going to do this n choose k? Yes. So for the for the general case, we'll do the n choose k. Yes, we don't know which one is coming, which is exactly why we do the n choose k. But but we will uh, yeah, obviously, but, um, but you need to get enough of them from each one, right? So we'll get a full basis. So we'll get n vectors, so that k of them lie in v and, k and n minus k of them lie in w. How do you guarantee that? That's the, that's the, uh, the algorithm. So, so far, we've got one, yeah. right? So the algorithm will be that uh, you find one, project orthogonal to it, repeat. That's, it, that's, that's how you find n of them. Um, now the only thing is, what if your moments end up being Gaussian? Right? What if in the in, in the in the first step, you're finding the first vector and you find the third moment is Gaussian? Right? And all the way up to mth moment, it looks like a Gaussian. What do you do then? Um, well, that only works if it's the con concept is convex. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So um, so what we're going to do first is let's check whether the function itself, the moment function itself, is Gaussian. So in other words check if, so for j less than or equal to m, check if this function fm of u, which is the expectation of x dot u to the m, is identically gamma m. Now this we can check, because this is just checking whether a polynomial is identically 0, and that you can do using the schwarz lemma. Yeah. I'm just, I'm yeah. Gamma m is the... Uh, 
No, no, gamma m is just, a, is a, is a, gamma is the distribution. Gamma m, I, I mean the mth moment of a Gaussian. So it's, it's just, scalar. yeah, it's a scalar. Zero if uh, you know, m is r and uh, oh, m minus one gamma double time. Specifically, it is the moment of a scalar. Exactly, okay. yeah. And can you keep running it down? Yeah, it's just m minus double factorial for m even. And double It's m minus one times m minus three times okay. m minus OK, so check if it's identically 0. How do you do this check? Well, that's the Schwartz simple lemma. Right? You uh, pick random x's from a large enough discrete set and uh, see when you substitute them whether you end up with exactly gamma. If it's the. Sorry? It will be eventually. M is the, n the which moment you go to will depend on the accuracy and the concept class. For now, I'm just doing it for a fixed m. OK. What you're doing, working with, is the empirical distribution. You got several samples, and uh, you're now thinking of expectation of that sign. Uh, Th that's a good question. Right now, I'm saying, thinking that we have access to the exact moment sense. Sure. Sure. And we'll move to the empirical distribution. We have to specify, make many details clear to move to the empirical distribution. Yeah. Yeah. What's the you, if you want to talk about identically, so it's. Uh, no, 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 no. The, I'm picking here u's, not x's. So this quantity can be written as, right, this expectation is some tensor, which is the moment tensor of x, right. times u, 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 u. Yes. And the u's are being picked randomly. Right. But you computed a based on that number of samples from x, and that's how you, that's how you do it in an algorithm. Yes. But for now, let's say we know a exactly okay. for, the, for f, right? a is just a function of f, and we know this moment tensor exactly. OK. So I have a basic question. So what is the j moment f? In every direction, in every direction, for every oh, u. So, okay, okay. so for every u, it has the same jet moments as the Gaussian. And that's exactly what this check is doing. Do you have the same jet moments as a Gaussian for every u? And it's, and it's not a Gaussian. Hmm? F is not a Gaussian. I see. So in every direction, it basically looks like a Gaussian. Yes. So it's like more right. right. So it's very close to it. Yeah, so we, we look at this. Um, this, uh, this function, check, use, check using this word triple lemma if this is true. And if, the, if, if it's true, then you move. move if, if yes, uh, go to the next j, right? J, uh, next j. If no, that means that you found a v such that this value at v is either greater than gamma m or less than gamma m. If it's greater than, we'll go to a local max. If. Uh, Fm is less than gamma m, we go to a local min. So what is v? Um, so if the answer to the Schwarz-Zippel test is no, there exists some vector v for which the, 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 the distribution's moment is different from the Gaussian. And then I'm just checking if it's higher than the Gaussian or lower than the Gaussian. If it's higher, we go to a local max. If it's lower, we go to a local min. Now, here, u is, u, this is a. U is a variable. Yeah, but I'm saying the one instance. Yes, exactly, exactly, <coughs> right. right, right, exactly. There exists a U, yeah. Uh, and so this U star we add to our basis, right? So let's say this 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 local max or min is U star. So add U star to the basis. Project orthogonal to U star, and repeat. No, no, it's OK. Any local optimum is fine. You argue that the maximum is positive in only one space, because otherwise it won't be maximum. It also works for the minimum. Uh, by, um, it's a good point. What we have to, we have, we're going to convert the minimum also to a maximum. Yeah, <laughs> with, a, with an extra operation that I'm not uh, mentioning. But yes. So um, that's that's the basic algorithm. Now I have to do two things here to make this a make this complete. Even for the independent noise case, when I assume that we know the moment tensors exactly, one is that it's possible that even after you found some vectors, the rest of the subspace looks Gaussian if you project away these vectors, but actually has correlations with you start. 
So there's a search procedure where we look for correlations using a very similar technique, but we look for zeros of a different polynomial. Um, and then, then the second part of the algorithm is, uh, is, is just once you have a basis, you try all subsets of size k to see if one of them lets you factor. Now, OK. Um, no, no. So the guarantee at the end of this algorithm is just going to be the following, that um, uh, you know, let's, let's define the distance between two distributions as um, uh, you just conclude that it looks like Gau it's, it's Gaussian up to mth moments. That's it. So, if, so e either you factor or you conclude that it's Gaussian up to m mth moments. That's it. So its distance from a Gaussian is, is 0 up to mth moments. OK. Say again? In fact, if you have both positive and negative examples, um, for uh, uh, any reasonable class of, 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 of uh, hypotheses, there is some moment at which either the positive distribution or the negative distribution doesn't look like a Gaussian. So if, it's, if it was a polynomial, then you just need to go to the kth moment, the degree of the polynomial, and at that point, one of the two doesn't look like a Gaussian. So, so there will be a bound where it doesn't look like Gaussian explicitly, but I won't have time to ent enter that. What I do want to point out uh, or, or, or describe at least a minute is two things. First is that this was all assuming exact moment tensors, and we actually have only approximate tensors which are calculated from samples. So something like the schwartz zippel lemma immediately makes no sense because the, we, we can no longer ask for an exact check. Right? In fact, what we want is to check whether a given polynomial p is bounded. You know, it's, it's smaller than epsilon everywhere in, in, the, in, in the domain, right? everywhere on the unit sphere. Okay, so you, you get a similar polynomial like that p of x, and you want to know if it's less than some uh, eta. Right? And for this, we can't just use this check. However, and maybe I'll just conclude with this, with this lemma, uh, the following holds. Uh, I guess it's a lemma that suppose you you, ha you consider only a convex set and uh, you uh, picked x random points x1 through xl and you find that the polynomial values p of xi are all um, less than epsilon okay now you would like to conclude something about the maximum of this polynomial over the convex set. Okay? And what we can get is that this supremum is at most, so if you try it L times, that with probability at least 1 minus 1 over 2 to the L, the supremum is at most epsilon times constant times n to the power of um, the, the, the degree of the polynomial. So P has degree M. So, okay. So if you, if you do, if you, so this is a robust, robust, sorry? Do you recover, I mean, so you're assuming a uniform distribution on the convex set? Or um, something close to uniform? What you want to do is bound the value of the polynomial on the entire convex set. Right, so I mean, is this like a Chebyshev type of bound? That's basically what we're doing, but, but this is a convex set, and we get to try out only a few points. So we're picking a few random points from the set. But do you check I mean, is the strategy, I mean, um, you know, you create a mesh over it or something like this? It's a bit more complicated. We have to really have to use the structure of the polynomial. So I can tell you what the uh, two-line proof is, which will have because a part that's... I mean, at least for dimension one, there's a quarrying strategy, yes. which is independent of the polynomial, right? Which you just looks at the point which are maximum to the Chebyshev. Yes. No, I don't know how to generalize that strategy. I don't know how to ask at a fixed set of query points. I mean, the set convex set is arbitrary. Even for the unit sphere, I don't know how to pre-specify. Right? Yes, exactly. Not clear that there exists a pre-specify. But if you pick random points, then this is okay. And uh, um, um, yeah, so if you, if you have some convex set, and, and if, if you find it's less than epsilon in most of the region, you want to say it's, it's actually less than something everywhere. You can't expect to do this in all of space because once you start seeing a little discrepancy, it could blow up as you scale out. But, uh, but if you know that in your domain 
with some probability it is less than epsilon and everywhere it is less than some bounded amount. And the proof of this is uh, is based on the localization lemma. So it is quite. No, no, this is, this is just a separate segment. So this is just how you would do this Schwartz Zippel check. I would, I would pick this uniformly, yes. <coughs> so the test would now pick uniformly from the set. I think that this tool has been used there. It's this lemma by Carberry and Wright. Okay, so so have you, yeah, so they give uh, uh, essentially this bound uh, uh, in a different form. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So that, 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 that's right. So, so it says that at least for polynomials of degree d, you, you can catch this maximum. So we substitute this check here for the schwartz zippel approximate check. That allows us to say you're approximately Gaussian in every direction. And if you're not, then you proceed and find local maximum and continue. Now, uh, local maxima, the part that I won't, definitely won't be able to get into, is um, you can't do exactly. You can only do approximately. Nevertheless, we can make sure the errors don't accumulate too fast by using a second-order Gaussian method. And that gives actually uh, an algorithm that's, if you assume here, so uh, let me just state the final theorem. Suppose f equals f v, <coughs> some unknown, no, unknown distribution on the, on the uh, relevant space. And then the rest of it is just a Gaussian of dimension n minus k. So the noise is just Gaussian. And the distribution is arbitrary. Then both question 1 and question 2, problem 2, can be solved in actually polynomial time. So by that I mean some function of k and epsilon, which could be huge depending on the concept class, and then uh, polynomial in n, where the degree of the polynomial depends on the concept class, um, but not, not, not on the accuracy or, or the actual, actual set. So uh, ah, I'll stop. Orthogonality is a funny concept here because you need a coordinate system to find things orthogonal. So you can still think about this assumption that uh, uh, FB and FW are just supported on two subspaces, but you don't know the <coughs> coordinate system that makes them orthogonal. And now, how would you? Uh, you're saying that there, the, what you really care about is a subset of is a subspace within yeah, V and sub yeah, yeah, that's fine. Have any orthogonality. Here you're saying that you would. Oh, here's I'm oh, sorry. So here's statistically. Yeah. Uh, the local optima don't seem to be very useful for hidden click. One approach that, that people have tried for the hidden click is to actually see if the local optima give you something useful. And there, the answer is, seems to be no. That the, you really are interested in the maximum given by this hidden click. And other ones seem to be completely not informative. The other local maximum. And there are exponentially many. Um, there was a paper by Friesen Kannan where they um, gave an approach to learning a product distribution, which in fact, so basically learning a cube that has been transformed. And there they used fourth moment. But um, uh, yeah. <coughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, so the all in, that, in, that, in that example, it so turns out that all the local level maxima are global maxima. But I mean, yeah. Sorry? No, no, not, not at all. These, uh, these, these, uh, these maxima could be very small inside the subspaces. They're, 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 uh, yeah, they don't have to be. There's no. Uh, 